and issues involved with Christianity, and again I will try to be brief uh, because I know that it is uncomfortable, but I do hope it might be a blessing to you. Uh, tonight I want to deal with the subject of uh, uh, capital punishment. In the Bible, I believe that there is the truth of a capital crime being met with capital punishment. Now, before I give these scriptures, I want to say this, uh, that personally, I would hate to ever have to sit on a jury involving something of that nature. Uh, because um, uh, I, it, it, it's not my style. However, I believe that somebody has to do it. And uh, I think that it is biblical. I think that it is right. And I'm going to try to show that from scriptures tonight, from both the Old and New Testament, about uh, capital punishment. And so, first of all, if you'll turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, I would like to read uh, just verse number 6. And this is right after the flood. Remember that God created the heaven and the earth. And by the time of Noah, uh, things had gotten so bad that the Bible says that uh, uh, the imaginations of man's heart was uh, only evil continually uh, back in chapter 6 and following. God sent a flood, uh, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And at that time of the flood, which is approximately 1,600 years after the creation, uh, somewhere in there, we have eight souls being saved in the ark that God had requested Noah to make. You recall, please, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was in the minority, was he not? I mean, out of all those people, and I have calculated for whatever it's worth, that there could have well been upwards of six billion people on the earth at that time of Noah. The reason being is because people lived such a long time back then. Remember, Methuselah lived 969 years. Adam lived to be over 900 years old. And it only took a couple of generations to go all the way from creation, clear down through to the guys who were in the ark. Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, probably knew Methuselah quite well. And I have to feel that Methuselah knew Adam uh, and uh, others. And so you can see how that very easily these guys could have transported the truth of God's creation and not being very far removed at all. Well, God destroyed the earth with a flood and uh, gave the rainbow as a sign that he would not do that again. So the rainbow is not a bad sign, even though it's been hijacked in this world that we live in. The rainbow is still a beautiful and a wonderful thing of God Almighty and the dispersion of light through a prism uh, action so on. In the flood, God destroyed destroyed the world, but there were eight people who got on the ark, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, just eight people. So don't ever forget that the majority is not always right. In fact, a lot of times when it comes to the Lord, you'll find the majority are wrong, not right, because they're going under the energy of the flesh and the energy of the things of secularism rather than that of the sacred and the things of the spirit. Well, in Genesis chapter number 9, there is what is referred to as the Noahic covenant being made. And in verse number 6, we have this interesting thing things stated. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Now that not only tells us of capital punishment, but it tells us of the sacredness of life. 
For in the image of God made he man. You need to keep those two truths in mind. And that would, of course, settle the subject of abortion uh, in my way of thinking. Uh, again, in Exodus chapter number 21, if you'll turn a little bit over further into the Bible. Oh, and by the way, last Wednesday night I spoke on the subject of uh, the current Supreme Court decisions and the LBGT movements and so on. And I gave a reference in Leviticus chapter number 18, verse 22 and following. And then I said, oh dear me, I've written down the wrong reference because it was on the wrong place on my Bible. That was the right reference. It was just on the wrong place of the Bible that I was using. I get to the point where I look on the page where it's supposed to be on the Bible and if it's not there... I think, oh no, I've written down the wrong reference. But that is the reference in case those of you who were here were waiting to hear about what the right reference was. Leviticus 18 and verse 22 and following happened to be the right references. Now, in Exodus, please, chapter number 21, I want to read verses 12 through 14. Now this is after the time of Moses. This is after the time of the uh, Tower of Babel and its uh, spreading of the peoples. And this we have then down in the uh, covenant of the law, as it were. And here's what the Bible says. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. In case you're interested, what is being set up there is uh, the rule of order. Like if it happened to be accidental, if it were not a, a premeditated, deliberate uh, crime, and that can be. Well, God allows for those things in the Bible, and it is my opinion that uh, the uh, former, uh, I use that for one of a better word, legal system of the United States was built upon much that was in the Old Testament law. I would state it this way for clarification, built upon the historic Judeo-Christian ethic. Now you can see that in Exodus chapter 21 where again I read he that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death and if a man lie not in wait but God delivered him into his hand then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee but if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die uh, in case you're wondering, when God said, from mine altar, uh, God is in many ways saying us, uh, don't uh, spare for his crying. You have got to do this if you're going to have order in your society. And uh, as you know, uh, there were provisions made for a, a man to flee to the altar of God for safety. But God is saying in so many words, uh, if he does that and he delivers, deliberately uh, killed his neighbor, you go get him even from my altar if he's there and take care of the punishment that is due. Now that may seem harsh, but I'm going to try to make a case for it in uh, just a moment. And then I would like for you to turn also uh, to Leviticus chapter number 24 and I'm going to read verse uh, number 17. Uh, he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, or as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. And then I want to look further into Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 6. And I have a special reason for looking at this that I hope you'll pay careful attention to. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter number 6, um, 
I'm going to begin my reading in verse number 5. Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates. Now in the Bible, the gates was a sign of like the courthouse, the, the county seat, so to speak. You remember Lot sat in the gate of Sodom? Well, what that means is he was official of some capacity in the city government of Sodom. The gates is that reasoning in the Old Testament. Now thou shalt bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, unto the place of judgment, uh, legal proceedings, uh, proper courtroom proceedings, even that man or that woman, and thou shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now look at verse 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Uh, with that I do go along, uh, brothers and sisters. I realize that we're getting involved in something here that would be called, I suppose, Chrissy, circumstantial evidence uh, versus literal eyewitness evidence. And I, I feel like I am safe in saying that in a court of law, even today, eyewitness evidence is the strongest form of evidence that there is. Uh, but I want you to notice that God is allowing uh, for something here that is very important because a guy could get it in for another person and accuse them of something that wouldn't be so. I think that goes on very much in our day that we live in. It went on in Christ's day, did it not? They finally found two witnesses in that case who were willing to be bought off, I think, and testify against Christ. Well, here you'll notice, please, in Deuteronomy, in this capital punishment, and in order to show the gravity of it, the seriousness of it, uh, the Bible says, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death. Now notice that phrase, worthy of death. Be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Now again, if you'll turn just a page over to Deuteronomy chapter number 19. Now look at verse number 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Now you may say, well, Brother Burkholder, all of those things are in the Old Testament and we are in the days of the New Testament. I'm glad you mentioned that. I want to look at a couple of New Testament verses that I think are going to be supportive of this. First of all, turn with me to Luke chapter number 23. Now in Luke chapter number 23, most of you are going to recognize it right away as being the crucifixion chapter of the gospel according to Luke. And they crucified Jesus Christ with the sign over him in verse number 38, this is the king of the Jews. And then in verse number 39, please, Luke chapter number 23. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And do you remember, please, that when they crucified Christ, they crucified two malefactors, two wrongdoers with Christ, who were considered worthy of capital uh, punishment. Uh, now I am one of those who is for uh, the thought of not using cruel or unusual punishment, and I think that crucifixion was one about one of the one of the most cruel that you could get with. Uh, but the Romans used it freely and seemed to be proud of it. And let me tell you this: that man, if he gets away from God, gets bloodthirsty, as it were. 
uh, people don't realize the clamp that godliness puts on society. People do not realize the benefit of Christianity in the society that we live in. In Christianity, there is compassion and love and kindness. And the, all of these people out here that want to get rid of Christianity, they're going to see what it's like one of these days in the tribulation period when the Holy Spirit of God is taken out in His uh, unusual activity of indwelling the blood and the restraining force of evil is gone. They're going to get their wish and they're not going to like what they get when that comes along. Well, here in Luke chapter number 23, please, if I may go back to it, they crucified the two male factors with Jesus Christ. And one of them, the Bible says, railed on Christ. Uh, I unfortunately must state that I fear many people are guilty of railing on Christ in this day that we live in. Something doesn't go to suit them, they what? Blame God. Why does God allow this? Why does He do that? Let me say this, we are in no position to counsel God. He's got all the facts. He's got all the situation down. We are much better off submitting to God's will. I want to tell you what, no good thing will He withhold from them who walk uprightly, right? So please remember that. Well, we have this one malefactor who railed on Christ. And he said, please, in verse number 39 again, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, verse number 40, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? I want to stop right there for a minute and take the time to state that the fear of God index has plummeted in this age that we live in. One of the big things wrong with our society is there's no fear of God before their eyes. Now, I tell you what, folks, you, you can... Um, uh, philosophize all you want to about the evils of Christianity and so on and so forth. But when the fear of God goes down, evil is going to go up. And here this other one said, interestingly enough, used this statement, Dost not thou fear God? saying that thou art in the same condemnation. And what was that condemnation? Capital punishment. Now verse number 41 interestingly states, And we indeed, what? Justly. Now what are we talking about? Capital punishment here. And this guy is saying, look, we deserve what we're getting. We are here indeed justly. And I think he is saying that from the prospects of the law that, the, that then existed in the Roman Empire. Mind you, that is a powerful phrase, we indeed justly. I'll go on in my reading. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. Did you get that? He is acknowledging we receive the due reward of our deeds. Some people say capital punishment is not in the New Testament. I suggest it is. Right there we have it. We receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Oh, what a wonderful truth concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I wish to point out this malefactor said we receive the due rewards of our deeds. And then there's one other place that I'd like you to to turn in the New Testament to show this or illustrate this place. And this is in John chapter number 19. Now, I referred to John chapter number 19 this morning in my uh, message. Uh, and uh, it had to do with uh, Pilate and uh, uh, his saying, I have the power to release thee or to put thee on the cross in so many words. And Jesus told him, uh, Thou hast no power at all except it be uh, from God. Now, here in John 19, I want to read it tonight, please, beginning in verse number 10. 
And then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Uh, Pilate was talking to Jesus. Remember, he asked Jesus a question and Jesus did not answer him, for which there is a reason of that. And we'll not go into that, obviously, tonight. Uh, but Pilate said, Don't you realize I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Now look at verse number 11. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. And it's that phrase, except it were given thee above, that you need to camp on for my purposes tonight. I'm talking about capital punishment given from above is what I'm pleading for you to understand. I find here in the New Testament, as well as in the Old Testament, capital punishment. Now, I want to make a case for capital punishment because some people say it is not a deterrent. The simplest case I want to make about its being a deterrent is the guy who is, who is put to death justly is not going to do it again. I mean, you got that. It's as simple as that. Not only that, but I'd like to uh, philosophically state for just a moment that the will to live is one of the strongest forces in mankind. If a man knows he's standing in the way of swift judgment, if he does search such and such, you cannot tell me that is not going to be something that enters his mind. Unfortunately, in the day that we live in, someone can commit a capital crime and by the time the appeals have taken their course, the guy can have died a natural death. Now granted, it may not be a very pleasant way to spend the rest of his life, but be that as it may, because of appeals, there have been cases where guys have died, and uh, hey, that was that. There is a principle found in Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament chapter 8 and verse number 11. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn there and look at that verse. And it's a principle that I'm going to bring just briefly to our attention, realizing that our, our time is swiftly uh, running out here. And I wanted to finish early because of the uh, discomfort of the heat. I understand that. But I understand also it's important for us to grab a hold of these words of God. It's more important for us to grab a hold of them than it is uh, for us to uh, have a little discomfort in our lives. So please, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 8 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Did I quote it correctly? I think I did. Now listen, what that verse is saying is since it seems far away to a person to receive the judgment that they should get, their heart is fully set to do evil. And I want to tell you that I believe that verse. I think that's not only true in cases of capital punishment, but I think it's true in cases of, well, the chastisement of God in Christians' lives as well. Now I realize I'm getting into a subject here that is uh, somewhat interesting and perhaps a little bit foreign to what our uh, overall subject is tonight. But i, I got to tell you something, folks. There'd be a lot of Christians change a lot of their ways if they knew they were going to go out of that bar and get a whipping from the Lord right away. There'd be a lot of Christians change a lot of their ways if they knew they were going to leave that house of ill repute and get a good spanking right out in front of everybody. Right? 
I mean, listen, when I was a little boy, you know why I didn't do a lot of stuff that went through my flesh? I know all of you think I was such a good little angel when I was little. I know... Don't shake your head. Uh, I've told you before about those clean sheets my mother used to hang up. You know, back in the old days, women washed in washing machines and hung the clothes up on lines. Any of you guys remember that? Uh, hey, bear me record. The clothes still smell better hung up and dried outside than they do in the dryer from the house, don't they? There is a, a, a smell about them. I mean, ah, you, you can't duplicate what God does with what man does. No way. Well, my mother used to wash those sheets. White sheets. That's all the sheets we had back in those days. We didn't have colored sheets and striped sheets and all that kind of thing. had white sheets to go to bed on. And uh, my mother had sheets out there. And uh, one day she hung up all those sheets and I had this little kid's shovel. And I was out playing and I took the shovel and I took dirt. And uh, the devil made me do it. <laughs> I mean, I let that dirt fly all over those wet, clean sheets. And my poor mother, she didn't know she was supposed to get me psychoanalyzed. She didn't know she was supposed to go to Washington, D.C. to get me figured out. She didn't know about these antipsychotic drugs or whatever the thing was. It's supposed to calm me down. I was a little angel after all. It really wasn't me. It was, it was society that made me do it. No, uh, my mother, she wasn't aware of all that stuff. She grabbed me and gave me a whipping. I mean, it's all, they used to use willow switches in my days. And um, I mean... Uh, my mother may have been a little woman, but man, she could whip. <laughs> you want to know why I never threw dirt on those sheets again? Even though it crossed my mind? You want to know why I didn't do it? Well, yes, Brother Burkholder, we know why you didn't do it. Because you loved your mother so much, and you didn't want to cause her any extra work. You were just such a nice young man. And, and we know you, Brother Burkholder. Uh, the devil just got in you for a minute there, but that was the only time that... I, you want to know why I never threw dirt on those sheets again? Because I could still feel the sting of that willow switch. Now I want to read that verse from Ecclesiastes, or quote it again, please. Ecclesiastes 8.11 Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. I got to tell you, you take a lot of us young people, and a lot of you older people as well, if we got it right away at the time, we'd change a lot of our ways. That's how I feel about it. Now, please, I got to be careful since I've said that. I am not trying to counsel God. God is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, right? Second Peter chapter number 3. But is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, everybody here tonight who's saved needs to be grateful that they don't get what they deserve. <laughs> If we got what we deserved, there wouldn't be even a grease spot left of us, I guess. Our God is merciful. Our God is gracious. But I want to tell you this. There comes a day when God puts away His grace and brings out His willow switch. Whom He loveth, He chasteneth. Don't let the devil fool you into living any old way you want to just because God doesn't have the lightning strike immediately. Believe me, things have a way of reaching their own level. I do want to say this, that in our country, I often think that if crimes were 
tried swiftly and I got to be careful because I'm not in unfairness whatever and I hate to see anybody unfairly judged I doubly hate that uh, but when there's a clear case it seems to me like it would be better to get the thing taken care of and taken care of in a hurry. Now, now please, I want to, on the other side of the fence, uh, state this very carefully, uh, that we don't need any lynch mobs. We don't need to get a kind of self-jury judge, jury, and executioner mentality going whatsoever. I am for fairness and I am for right. But I gotta tell you this, society's going to have to have a way of punishment or they're gonna have anarchy. And that there is degree of sin on this horizontal horizontal level is seen in that there are degrees of punishment. And I believe that that should show us that likewise God keeps track of us. And somewhere down along the line, I want to say this, be sure your sin will find you out. And that's straight from the Bible. My mother used to say the chickens come home to roost. I want to emphasize that to every Christian here tonight. I want to likewise emphasize the love of God and the mercy of God. And if you're here tonight and not saved, God will save you tonight. But if you never get saved one of these days, you're going to have to spend eternity in hell. I want to emphasize God loves you, He loves me. Even after we get saved, I can truthfully say God has dealt far more with me in mercy than He has in what I have as my just desserts. I am grateful for that. Of course, I am grateful also that the Lord Jesus has made a way for us to confess our sins. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Oh, that's got to be one of the sweetest words in the English language. But I'm still going to say this. While God is merciful, while God is loving, while God is kind, oh, He is ever so much that way. God is also just. God is also righteous. And ultimately, God will prevail. May we stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for thy love and goodness. I thank you for this time that we have together tonight. Now, Lord God, I pray that thou shouldest have thy will and way on this invitation. If there's anyone here tonight, Lord, not saved, I pray that you might speak to their hearts tonight, that they might have the desire to come and realize the joy and the wonder of salvation in thy dear Son. I pray, O oh God, for thine own people here tonight. Help us, God, to realize that just because your judgment does not swiftly come does not mean you're not monitoring our ways. Help us, O oh God, to realize and understand that you're patient, that thou art kind, that thou art our loving God, and oh, I praise thy name for that, Lord Jesus. But God, help us to have the sense not to license ourselves because of it. Oh God, I pray thee to convict us. I pray thee to work on our hearts. I ask, Lord God, that whatever the need is of any heart here tonight, Thou shouldst meet that need according to Thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus, our blessed and precious Savior, in whose name I pray. Amen. Number 39 in the book, if you'd like to sing along on this hymn of invitation.